I've seen patients with, you know, razor thin frontal lobes. Like they've got such great atrophy and none of them are violent. You know, they're, they're not murdering people or committing suicide. It's, it's very rare for people with frontal temporal dementia. So I'm wondering in these egregious cases like uh, Philip Adams and Aaron Hernandez, where was this deposition? You know, where in the brain, what, was it like lo located in a very specific area that caused this violent behavior? Or was it they had, you know, some nasty childhood experiences and other factors that led to narcissism and some other antisocial personality disorder stuff that caused some yeah, you know, maybe exacerbated by multiple head injuries. Well, no, let's let let's dig in on that because like Hernandez has very clear social parts. If Adam's case doesn't necessarily, so I think what what's interesting about uh, so I'll tell you just sort of what the conversation that we're having, which is, you know, you're, I think you're absolutely right. Like the end stage CT like does isn't well. It's like, I'd like to say it's not associated with violence, but we just helped an NFL wife whose husband tried to choke her to death and mm. put him in mm. a nursing home, and he's about, he died months later. Mm. Like that happens, yeah. as you know. Uh, but again, it's rare. And it's, you know, but then there's also the idea that um, when you have CTE, there's also other brain damage that comes with it, right? The path to CTE involves again thousands of head impacts, and so. We certainly like we're very focused on and we're trying to better understand, but it doesn't have the great pictures or scale white matter damage, right? We see tons of white matter generation in these folks and we see it more associated with behavioral changes. And so sort of the general feeling right now, just to maybe skip ahead a little bit, is that like yeah, this idea that C T severe C T is definitely associated with cognitive impairment and definitely associated with dementia. I don't think people are questioning that. And then the question is what's going on with these folks from twenty to sixty or twenty to yeah. fifty? And the message that we're trying to push out to those folks is whether or not you have CT, it's, it, the, 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 t the line between your behavior and tau pathology is very, is not strong. Yeah. But there's these other things that you could have done in your brain that you could be related. But either way, it's not, this isn't the progressive point. This isn't the end of your life. This isn't the, the you're guaranteed to go any direction. If you can get through the mental health challenges through treatment, through medical doctors and a better understanding, you can have a, a nice, fine life. Yeah. And so that's what we're messaging those, those midlife people. But when we talk about someone like Philip Adams, like remember the FBI, like he was writing crazy journals and the FBI looked through it and they could, they could not yeah. find any reason why any of this happened. Mm -hmm. And the only like evidence is not only CT, but he had, uh, you know, he had frontal lobe atrophy, right? And you know, the, 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 the homicide suicide thing, like I gotta tell you, I'm colored by my first couple of years in this, which is the idea that you know, let's remember there was Mike Webster and Terry Long in, uh, died in 02 and 05. Mm -hmm. You know, we know Webster's horror lo story, Terry Long, multiple suicide attempts. None of them is because they thought they had CT. Then Andre Waters takes his life in 2006 before there's ever any news around CT. And then Justin Strelzik's getting chased by the police having a psychiatric, psychiatric episode uh, in his late 30s before anyone, and that happened actually before Waters died and his brain was just kept. And then 10 days after I incorporated the foundation, Chris Benoit, who I personally knew for five years, was a great guy, kills his wife and uh, son and himself, right? Those are the first five CT cases in America, right? So and none of all those happened before anyone was talking about CT. So the idea that those things aren't related, you know, just on its face, like consider, you know, now we have, we have a lot of murders in this brain bank, right? And they all had a, have, have an FCT. And so it may not be, it's, you're right, it's probably not the tau pathology, but is it other elements of brain damage or, I mean, I have to imagine there's some, there might be something tying those together besides just randomness and they were all athletes. Yeah, you do wonder what brings, you know, what I've always, I played football growing up and I loved it, I loved to hit. You know, I, I was told at the age of nine when I started in, uh, I think it was junior peewees by my coach, where else in the world can you hit someone as hard as you want and not go to jail? Yeah. And so they coaches nine, love that phrase. We all heard it. At <laughs> nine years old, I'm thinking this is where I want to be. You know, uh, I want to hit as hard as I can. And so I remember thinking that and um, enjoying that, the violence of the game. Is you, you get everything out there. But I think, um, so that makes me wonder, is violence part of what drives people to a game like football or some other combat sports? Um, it's kind of this tendency, you know, I've looked up, I tried to actually, uh, you know, review the literature on that and all I can find was a few studies that suggest that people 
who had played football aren't any more violent, don't, get, don't break the law any more than, than others. And I think maybe they're part of the program and you know things are covered up like Aaron Hernandez's first few uh, things were, but, um, but maybe not. So I, anyway, that's one question that comes up is, is playing the game in and of itself and what drives people to play the game a precursor to you know, a vulnerability to violence. And um, I like the idea of thinking, what else aren't we measuring other than tau pathology that could be correlated to that type of behavior? But one thing that I read recently was um, the article where uh, the BU group and, um, and others tried to validate the 2014 uh, TES, the tra Traumatic Encephalopathy Syndrome criteria, and came up with, you know what, cognition and a progressive course of 12 months or more are really the things that make diagnosing in life by clinical criteria more accurate to the uh, CTE pathology. And uh, in the supplement, it has all of the uh, clinical symptoms that were reviewed, like violence and irritability, impulsivity, aggressive, aggressiveness, things like that. And for the CTE and non-CTE cases, a lot of those things were lockstep. Yeah. And uh, post-concussive syndrome, in fact, was more prominent in people who had played sports but not were not diagnosed with CT on, on autopsy. So I was just trying to like put all that together. What the, the pathology and the clinical phenomenon seems to not be correlated yet. Well, there's a couple ways to look at that. Uh, what the, the, when I look at that scale, what I see is the person who makes the most calls to families is that there's a there's a profile of what people think CT is, mm -hmm. and those are the people in the brain bank. So mm -hmm. they're all like that's why you get 80, 90 percent of all of these symptoms, is because that's who's donating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We do we do have some we're working on studies that'll have more pure control groups. Mm -hmm. So you can say like oh no, I, so then the question will be like well you know who are these people who are negatives. Why are they that way? Because we know that, like, and people are going to end up in these places without getting CTE. Yeah. So there is a lot to tease out there. I think y the question on um, football and uh, and people, there's two uh, two ways to think about that. One is, if you and I do have violence, you know, a little bit in our DNA, it's like it doesn't surprise me if things go wrong. If you take somebody who's already got a impulse for this and then start to give them some brain damage, right? Like that would make sense. And then the bigger question of like versus population, population is almost always the wrong control group, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. for, for, for elite athletes. And I think we've seen this over and over again. And actually, I just reviewed a study that was rejected because there were three buckets, football players, non-contact sport athletes, regular people. Mm -hmm. Football players and regular people had the same levels of depression, all these other things. But the football players were much worse than the non-contact sport mm -hmm. athletes. Mm -hmm. But this researcher who's got a bias for this was only comparing it to the control group and I don't think realized he had the data for the for the better control group, which <laughs> is the other elite athletes who were hit in the head. Mm -hmm. And that came out today, I don't want to put a date on this conversation, but a study came out from um, researchers at Columbia and the Mayo Clinic on hockey players. Mm -hmm. And they found that they compared ways uh, ages of death and ways of death for fighters versus non-fighters in, in the NHL. They found that um, not only were the fighters dying younger by 10 years, but they died in completely different ways, right? So there were 11 of the 21 deaths of, of fighters who've played since 1967 was things that they said, not us, that they thought could be related to CT, neurodegenerative disease for a couple of them, suicide, um, four auto accidents, only one in the control group and uh, overdoses. Z and, and for neurogenerative disease, suicide, and overdoses, there were zero mm -hmm. in the non-fighters, mm -hmm. right? Because there's great benefits to sports participation. And so if you do sports and don't get hit in the head, you, ca you should expect to live longer and healthier. So, um, so anyway, so I think, and I, yeah, when we talk about regular control groups, let's remember when you're comparing like NFL players, like these are people who through 25 were the best physically, genetically, you know, never got sick, you know, had great attitudes, you know, all that stuff. And that's not the population necessarily. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anyway, but again, it's, it's more like trying to have a, a useful conversation around this, right? Because yes, not everything is CT and, but there's are people suffering and how do we have the best, um, how do we move this forward to reduce harm for people and also not create other harm for people worrying about that?